What is up, everybody? Chris of Midlife Crisis Media here. Welcome to another episode of the Film Collection 2024 live streams. Today, I'm going to be, it's actually going to be the first of two because looking at what I'm going to talk about tonight on my shelving unit that I have them on, it doesn't look like it's a whole lot because these things are big, take up a lot more space than normal. Well, Upon pulling them out and starting to stack them up over here so I can talk about them, I realized I have way too many to talk about in one live stream. So I'm going to split this in half. So I'm going to rename this part one next week. Well, not next. Well, yeah, next week. It'll be on Wednesday. Uh, will be part two. So what am I talking about tonight? I'm talking about all of the box sets, multi-film compilations, and just generally oversized blu-rays that i own in my collection what i mean like oversized is like you know what a typical blu-ray cover or a blu-ray case is it looks like that right we're talking stuff that's tall won't fit on the shelf that's specifically designed to house dv or uh, blu-rays of that height wide take up a whole lot of shelf space you know that could be going towards you know i could probably fit four regular blu-ray cases on that shelf in place of this one wide one that kind of stuff so i have all of that kind of stuff off in its own area so that my standard blu-ray and 4k shelving unit is just standard size cases so last week i talked about all of the tv shows that i have on blu-ray so we're going to talk about all of these collections here <clears throat> starting off with by the way, does my, uh, if anybody's here, does my audio sound okay? I realized when I was, when I first started streaming, I was hooked up through Wi-Fi. So I quickly ran over, grabbed my Ethernet cable, plugged it in, turned the Wi-Fi off. I saw a couple of errors appearing on the live stream counter over here, but it looks like it's okay now. I just don't know if everything else looks and sounds okay on the other end. So anybody who's here, let me know. So we'll start off with classics. The, the dirty as hell, too. It's covered in dust. The Alien Anthology. So this has Alien 1 through 4 on it. Uh, it doesn't count any of the 2000s era sequels, prequels, whatever they are. Um, and I will not get rid of this, even though we have 4K versions of the original Alien film and Aliens just came out last month. Uh, they don't have the special editions of the films on there and for on those sets in 4K. So I will not be buying them until we can get a full set like this with all of the films. I don't care if it has like the prequels on it, as long as it has the original four uh, with their special editions intact, which is why I like this one as much as I do. Okay, so this has Alien, Aliens, Alien 3, and Alien Resurrection in it. I really like the kind of metallic cover that it has, and it has a real hard case. On the back, it has the egg logo from the original, as well as tells you what movies are in here. And the movies themselves come in this, like, book, which I hate. I talked about it in some recent pickup live streams and all that. I think it was the, uh, the Avatar movies that I bought in 4K. They come in this kind of cardboard sleeve uh, instead of a plastic case that holds it in place. These could possibly scratch up these discs to the point where they're unusable. And I don't like that. So I don't approve, but I do like the slim... You know, the, the, the slim factor of it, you know, the, the width of it is not gigantic because if I were to own each of these movies individually, it would definitely take up twice as much space. So you open it up, Alien Anthology, got some words about the original film, and then you go to the next page, and it has some information about the film, some stills, and the disc. And like I said, it comes out of this cardboard sleeve and it is really hard to get a hold of you almost have to bend the page to get it out i can't stand this packaging don't understand why people keep using it yeah it's probably cheaper 
But for the consumer, for you know, longevity's sake, uh, yeah, this is crap. But yeah, got the first movie. And the cool thing about this set is each film has its extended cut, special edition cut, whatever you want to call it, on the disc. So we have the original film, the original theatrical cut, and the special edition version that Ridley Scott released, I think it was like in the mid-2000s. Uh, it had a couple of extra scenes with uh, Captain Dallas. Uh, Ripley finds him cocooned, and he's like begging her to kill him. Uh, there's a couple of extra scenes. The movie was really cut down for gore because I remember reading that each kill scene like was graphic, like people being like ripped to shreds kind of stuff. And I think a couple of extra shots of like blood spraying and stuff are mixed back into that cut. But first movie, absolute classic. I love it. Uh, a bunch of space truckers that are in hypersleep on their way back from a big hall. They never tell you where they were coming from. Uh, get awakened by the company that they work for to say that, hey, we got to rescue like an SOS from this nearby planet that you're passing up. Uh, go and investigate. Turns out there's this crashed alien ship down there. It has all these eggs uh, in like this one like cargo area. And one of the eggs opens up and a creature attaches itself to the face of one of the crewmen. Lays an egg in his throat, uh, alien gestates in his chest, bursts out, grows to a gigantic size, and starts offing all of the members of the crew one by one, and has a very cool, like, I don't even remember if my parents told me the, the twist, was that you they're making you think the entire movie that the captain of the ship, Dallas, uh, played by Tom Skerritt, was going to be the hero of the story. They make you think that because he's always taking charge. People start acting crazy. He's the person to calm them down, that kind of stuff. Like, you know, he is the the top dog in the in the cast. And then halfway through the movie, they kill him. And then it's kind of like up in the air. I'm like, oh, my God, who's going to save everybody? And then it turns out to be like the person that most of the characters don't like. And it's this character Ripley, play, played by Sigourney Weaver. And she ends up being a freaking badass. I mean, like, the times, the reasons why people don't like her in the movie is she was just doing her job. Like, when... Uh, the one character, Kane, got infected. You know, he has the alien face hugger, you know, stuck to his face. You know, she doesn't want to let him on the ship because, you know, how do we know that's not going to infect other people and kill the rest of us kind of thing? She's in the right. And everybody's like, you know, F you. That's our, that's our friend. Let him in. And everybody hates her for wanting to keep him out. She's doing what she's supposed to be doing. <laughs> and then she ends up being like the big badass of the story. And I absolutely love that. When my parent, I'm glad that my parents never ruined that for me when I first watched it. And here's a shot of the navigator with the hole in his chest that they find on the alien ship, which is awesome. And then we have the sequel that came out a few years later from James Cameron, Aliens, which is an even better movie, and it kind of shifts genres. So the first movie is a science fiction horror film. It's essentially like a haunted house movie. Like there's a stalker in the house, and you don't know where, where he is or when he's going to strike kind of thing. James Cameron turns this franchise into a sci-fi action you know, franchise at this point. Ripley ends up having to go back to that planet where they found the alien ship in order to like stop the nightmares she has about the, the experience that she had on the Nostromo, or the, the ship that she ended up blowing up in the end of the first movie, with a bunch of Marines to take out the aliens that have supposedly killed everybody on the planet because they've colonized the planet in the meantime. She was in hypersleep. After the end of the first movie, turns out she was out there for like 80-some years. And in the meantime, the colon colonists have gone and colonized that planet, found the crashed ship, and uh, everybody is uh, getting killed by aliens. And it's fantastic. I absolutely love it. And especially the extended special edition cut of the movie, which is on here. That is my preferred version of the movie. It gives greater meaning as to why uh, Ripley latches on to the character of Newt. Uh, you find out that in while Ripley was in hyperspace for that 80-some years. What's up, Game Room? How's it going? Hope you're well, too. I'm doing okay. Tomorrow's the Midwest Gaming Classic. Going to spend the whole weekend with a bunch of YouTube friends, buying video games, being irresponsible with my money. <laughs> it's going to be great. Um, yeah, so you find out that while Ripley was in hypersleep that you know she did have a daughter that she left behind when she went on the job in the first movie. And in the interim, you know, over that you know, those 80 some years, her daughter died. And they tell her in the direct in the extended cut, your daughter died while you're in hypersleep. It makes it even more it makes even more sense as to why she like latches onto Newt the way she does, because it's like a surrogate daughter. 
And uh, there's a whole bunch of extra scenes of alien attacks and uh, uh, Bishop doing some extra stuff. It's it's a better version of the movie as far as I'm concerned. I like that way more. I'm just pissed off that Cameron didn't remaster that cut in 4K along with the theatrical cut for that new 4K release that they released, which is why I didn't buy it. Because I would rather watch that cut over any other. There's a shot of the iconic fight Ripley has with the Alien Queen. And then we come to Alien 3, which I think is the most misunderstood film in the franchise. It had a, it had big shoes to fill. Expectations were like through the roof because Aliens was such a huge hit. It's considered it was considered a classic even back then. Um, and like it had a lot of behind the scenes troubles. And what happened? So it went through a bunch of different directors, a bunch of different scripts. Like uh, directors came in and were talking about like, oh, it's going to take place on a planet made of wood that was built by monks. And the inside is like a giant monastery. That's dumb. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, what if the aliens come to Earth? Because they released a teaser trailer that showed the egg that they showed in the trailer for the first film. And then all of a sudden, like the planet Earth comes into frame and it's like they're here. And it's like, oh, is that what the plan is? Alien, the aliens are coming to Earth. That's cool. No, that's not what happened. Like nobody could agree on what the the, uh, the movie was going to be. And eventually, David Fincher came in like at the last second. It was his first major film. Now he's like this, you know, god tier director out there uh, to kind of like put the pieces together. You got a wood planted in your pants. I'm sure you do, Peter. I'm sure you do. Damn. Uh, and he like basically like took the scraps of whatever scripts were available, kind of cobbled them together, and tried to make as much sense out of it as he could. I think he did a great job. So. Um, Ripley at the end of the last movie she has Newt with her she has the remains of Bishop the android and Hex who's wounded got sprayed with alien blood at the end of the movie and they're all in hypersleep they crash on this planet turns out it's a, a backwater prison planet there are no weapons there uh, it's all males they're all like ex-rapists and murderers and all this kind of stuff um, and there's no way off the planet, really. There is no; they have no like spacefaring capabilities. It is a prison, and people are just they're stuck there. Um, and she's the only female there because everybody in the crash dies except for Ripley. And turns out she's also been impregnated with an alien, and it's a queen. And there's another alien loose on the planet, and it's going through all of the prisoners. And it's the movie's really violent. It's really dark. It's also creatively shot. I, I feel. Um, I like the fact that this one kind of decided to go with like, so the first movie I said was like a sci-fi horror movie, like a sci-fi haunted house. Second one's a sci-fi action movie. This one is like a sci-fi thriller. Uh, it's You'd never know when the alien's going to strike, kind of like in the first movie, but when they do action scenes, it's like the action scenes from the first movie. It's like chaotic and crazy. The visuals are great. David Fitchers, I've always felt, has been a great visual filmmaker. And uh, I like the characters a lot. I like the relationship between Ripley and the doctor who's on the planet. And it's they kind of pull the rug out from you on that one, too. And I think that's great. And it does have a bit of finality in it because, spoiler alert, she dies at the end. She sacrifices herself so that the alien queen won't be birthed and create more aliens to kill people. With, you know, So I always felt this one was great. I saw it in the theater. I don't think it was opening weekend. I saw it like maybe like a week after with a couple of friends and my friend's mom. I think she drove us there. Because this came out when I was still in high school. And, like, I absolutely loved it. I was just kind of like, wow, like, each of these movies is completely feels completely different. And I love that. They weren't trying to repeat themselves yet. So I was, like, totally in love with it. And I, I bought the novelization. And I bought these magazines that talked about how the special effects were done. And behind the scenes stuff, I was, like, totally into it. I still think it's one of the most underrated science fiction films out there. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And the thing is, there is a special edition cut on this as well, which is actually better than the theatrical cut because Fincher had to go back and do a bunch of reshoots because they had a test screening and people were just kind of like, that's dumb. Instead of the alien coming out of a dog like it does in the theatrical cut, it actually came out of one of the steers that they were using to hoist the escape pod that Ripley crashed in back onto the uh, shore. Um, they actually show Ripley wash up on shore after the crash and the doctor finds her on the shore you know, covered in the lice that they keep talking about because everyone on the planet has to shave their head because they have a lice problem. Um, there's more shots of the alien killing people. There's 
uh, more stuff about her talking about uh, her, you know, her life before all this happened and stuff like that. It's great. I absolutely love it. So there's that. There's a shot of Ripley in the uh, life pod hyper hyper sleep chamber that uh, cracked where they find her in the theatrical cut. And then we have Alien Resurrection, which is the one that I think is a piece of shit. This is the one where they decided to kind of copy Aliens and go for, like, for some reason, sci-fi action comedy. Don't think the comedy thing fits. I don't mind a little humor now and then to lighten things up. But when you have people doing stupid comedy routines in the middle of the film, it's dumb. I hate it. And the fact that Joss Whedon wrote it, too, kind of pisses me off. So I was super excited for this after Alien 3. So were my friends. We went and saw it opening night. And we all walked out of the theater going like, what was that? <laughs> um, and then Joss Whedon, when I met him in person, joked that, uh, what was it? He, he, I was there to see him talk about working on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Someone asked him about Titan AE, that animated movie that came out in like 2000, I think it was. And he was just like, yeah, I wrote a movie that shut down an entire animation studio. Okay. And he's, I'm like, you're joking about a bunch of people losing jobs. You're an asshole. Uh, and then I met, I have this, I have the script book of this. I still have it. Uh, I bought like a copy of the script at Walden Books or something. And I had him sign it. And I asked him if they brought you back to write a fifth movie. Because this movie does kind of end on like a cliffhanger. Not a cliffhanger, but open for more. Uh, would you come back? He's like, not in your life. <laughs> So they clone Ripley after she dies. Like it's like 200 years after she died. Uh, these the the company that wants to breed the aliens for you know biological weapon purposes clone her, and the byproduct is they want to get the queen. They don't give a shit about her. They just want the queen that was inside of her. They manage to get the queen, but their leftover like the leftover thing is the side effect is they have a clone of Ripley too. So they just kind of like lock her up or whatever. And then a bunch of uh, mercenaries come in and bust the place up, and she escapes. And the aliens that the guy they're breeding on that ship get loose, and yay! And it has a decent cast. It has uh, Ron Perlman in it, but he is so freaking bad in this movie. Everything that comes out of his mouth is like a dumb joke. And like that whole scene with the spider, it's like it's an a it's a middle of an action scene where people are trying to climb up this shaft, and there's aliens chasing after them. And, uh, like, Ron Perlman does this really cool move where he, like, locks his legs around one of the rungs of the ladder and leans backwards so he can shoot straight down at the aliens that are climbing up the ladder after him and his, his crewmates. And then when he comes back up to grab the, the rung to climb up, there's, like, a spider web in front of him with a spider. And he goes, ah! and, like, shoots it with the gun. And what are you doing? <laughs> it's just so dumb. One of the main characters gets an uh, alien, bites him in the back of his head, and, he, like, reaches back and pulls out a chunk of his own brain. And like looks at it and goes like, huh, and then dies. Oh, what are you doing? I hate it. I absolutely hate this one. It is so dumb. And it's ugly. It Like the whole movie is brown. <laughs> it's just really ugly. I don't like the special effects. They try to do some cool things like have aliens swimming and stuff like that. Uh, but it's I think it's just a freaking terrible movie. That big newborn thing at the end of the movie, the hybrid alien human thing, it's just it's ugly as hell and I hate it. Uh, and then it kind of ends on a cliffhanger. But this also does have a special edition, like, length lengthened version. There's a different opening credit sequence. Uh, it has a different ending where you actually see, like, uh, whatever the ship was, the Betty that they escape, everyone escapes on at the end of the movie. You see it actually land on Earth, and they everybody gets out and, like, sits on the rocks and looking around like, wow, Earth is a wasteland and all that. It's like, okay, that was definitely better than what we had in the movie. Uh, but I still don't like it at all. There's a shot of the aliens underwater, CG aliens. And then there's two discs worth of extras. I talked way too long about that, <laughs> but it's a franchise I love, so of course I'm going to talk about it at length. Highly recommend picking that up if you haven't already. Like I said, if they come out with a 4K set that has not only the theatrical cuts and the special edition cuts remastered in 4K, I will gladly get rid of this to pick that one up. And then continuing on the Alien thing, I have the Alien vs. Predator double feature. I don't like either of these movies. I love the comic books. First movie is probably the closest to the comic books you're going to get. It does steal scenes right out of the Dark Horse comics, which I thought was great. I just didn't like the movie that surrounded it because they kind of like retcon some of the Alien rules. Like, 
in the alien movies, they make it look like it like if you get infected, like if it, if a face hugger lands on you and implants an egg in you, it takes quite a while for the alien to gestate in you before it bursts out of you. And here it looks like it takes five minutes. It's like some one some characters get a, get like a face hugger on them and then they wake up from like the initial being knocked out by it and they wake up and bleh. It's like, no, that's not how it works. But it, it, whatever, it's just for the for the sake of keeping the movie fast paced. Um, I don't like any of the characters in the first movie. Uh, some of the action scenes are cool. It's directed by Paul W S Anderson, who directed the majority of the Resident Evil movies, the first Mortal Kombat film, Event Horizon. So I like his visual style. There's a really rad fight between an alien and a predator, where like an alien, the alien gets like half of its tail cut off, but it decides to use the fact that its tail is now bleeding to use his tail like a whip and fling acid at the Predator, which I thought was kind of cool and creative. We've never seen anything like that in the other movies. But outside of that, I was not a fan. Um, although the alien teaming up with, I think her name was Lex, at the end of the movie is right out of the comic books. Or the Predator teaming up with Lex at the end is right out of the comic books. Second movie, I think... It's terrible, but I think I like it more because it just kind of goes for it. The first movie was PG-13. There is an unrated cut of the first movie on here, but the first one was PG-13. They were trying to rake in all those teen bucks, you know? The second movie just kind of goes the hell with it. We're going hard R. And what's the one of the first things that happens in the movie? You see a kid get killed. And, like, everybody, even the ones that you think are supposed to be the leads in the movie, end up getting killed in some horrific fashion. Like, one guy gets trapped underneath a bleeding alien and, like, the blood melts his face off right in your face. Uh, some girls running that you think is like going to be the main love interest, and all of a sudden, like the predator's little like ninja star thing pins her to the wall, just like goes right through her side and pins her to a wall. It's like it's really graphic and over like over the top, and like there's a predator alien running around that is impregnating pregnant women with babies <laughs> and stuff. That stuff is stupid, but at least that one is at least trying to like push the limits of what is you know violence wise for like an r rating i was i was okay with that like you have a pg-13 alien movie the hell with that at least they try to make that one R, but it's still terrible yeah instead of what it became yeah i'd rather i'd still rather watch the second one over the first one just because it's like look this one was made for adults <laughs> but it's still terrible and then I have the director's cut of Amadeus. And the reason I have this in with the box sets, and because this one is like an oversized, it's a little too tall for the shelf that I have all my Blu-rays on. Like you can see that it's just slightly too tall. And it does not fit on my shelf. And also it is too wide because this has multiple discs. So you got the film. Also comes with a booklet. Special CD compilation, yeah, and it also comes with, like, the soundtrack, which I think is pretty rad. But there's a book built into this packaging. So you've got, like, the, the disc here, and then this whole thing in the middle is a book about the making of the film. And it's a great movie. I love Mozart's music, so I gravitated toward it already, but I think it's all about the performances. F. Murray Abraham as Salieri, he just, like, rules this movie. Uh, it's... Kind of funny. It's sad. <laughs> it's it's great, but it's a good doc documentary. Not documentary. Uh, what do you call it? Auto biography of uh, Amadeus. I think it's great. I need to watch that again. I haven't watched that in like ten years. And then I have this set, and it is the Anchorman: Legend of Ron Burgundy, the Rich Mahogany Edition. It comes in this like oversized box, and you've got not only the movie in here. But also this book that is the many months of, of Burgundy, which is like a diary written in by hand by Burgundy. Hair at hair at Degrino's from eleven to at eleven a.m. to he's got he has a hair appointment from eleven a.m. to six p.m. Meet with Keith in the Long Beach in Long Beach about buying a pet monkey. Could be a boat. <laughs> could be a hoot. Oh, could be a hoot. His handwriting is terrible. Shave chest hairs into the shape of a battleship. <laughs> Stuff like that. It's just dumb. But the thing about this is it has another movie uh, and a, on a separate disc called Anchorman Wake Up Ron Burgundy, which is basically they shot so much footage for this movie 
that they were able to make a second f- film out of it, and it's like a sequel. Uh, <laughs> it kind of had it kind of has some overlapping footage from the first movie, but like I said, they filmed so much stuff they were able to edit together an entirely different film. It's not nearly as funny as the OG. This is probably the only movie of Will Ferrell's that I can actually sit through and not want to like kill myself because I cannot stand uh, Will Ferrell. I just I think he's like a tryhard. He tries way too hard to be funny and isn't actually funny. Except here. And it's mostly because of his supporting cast. You got uh, Paul Rudd, David Ketchner, uh, Carell, Steve Carell. Come on, get in there. What is this stupid thing doing? Why can't... Why isn't this fitting? Something is going on in here. Oh, it's because there's something else in there. Oh, there's a pack of Anchorman cards in here. Has all the different characters. Jack Black. <laughs> and all that. Yeah. It's ben Stiller. The uh, the fight scene with all the different stations fighting is one of my favorite scenes from a comedy ever. Like, I killed someone with a trident. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. This stupid thing is not... Oh, man. Why did I buy this? <laughs> anyway. one of the It's the only Will Ferrell movie I can sit through. Then I have this uh, double feature of German horror movies, and that is Anatomy. And the only reason I, I watched the first Anatomy is because it has Franca Potenta in it from uh, Run, Lola, Run, and the Born Identity in it, and I had like a huge crush on her after seeing Run Lola Run, and it's about um, she's a med student at this like real prestigious medical school. <laughs> yep, rock me on my days. I was waiting for you to do that, Peter. I was waiting for you. Uh, yeah, she's at this real prestigious medical school, and there's like students that keep going missing while she's there, and it turns out that like a bunch of the students are making those li- what are they called? Like those living anatomy statues that you can go to the museums to see. Where it's like the, the bodies have been like petrified and they've like pulled the skin back so you can see like the musculature and detail and all that. Or like it's like they've been uh, preserved somehow. They're actually turning the students into those statues and Franco Potenta gets wind of it and tries to stop it. And then there's a sequel. Franco Potenta is barely in it. I don't even remember what the second one is about. It has been so long. But it's another story that take another horror movie that takes place at a medical school. I don't remember what. It's all about. It's been. I've only seen it once. The first one is actually pretty rad. Second one, I remember being pretty pretty bad. It does have a pretty cool song by what is it? The Cardigans. I think there's a band. Maybe not the Cardigans. There's a band that does like an industrial kind of song for the end credits, and the music video is on here. I remember that being kind of cool, but I don't have fond memories of the second movie. And then there's another double pack. Uh, this is the Atlantis Lost Empire and Milo's Return. Two movie collection, Disney animated films. Um, I really did enjoy the first Atlantis. I saw it in the theater opening night, um, and that was back when I was actually into watching like Disney animated films. Uh, the first Atlantis movie is essentially a ripoff of Stargate. Like scenes are taken straight out of Stargate. Like the whole thing with Daniel Jackson getting booed out of a uh, what was it uh, an exhibition thing he was doing, or like one of the he was doing like a keynote. Uh, speech or something at like a museum and everyone laughs him off the stage because of his theories of the aliens using the pyramids as landing pads uh, and all that and in this he's talking about like oh Atlantis is a real thing we can find it we can do it and everyone's like yeah yeah you're crazy it's Stargate through and through except instead of going to space you're going down to the bottom of the ocean it's fun I like it I like the characters Michael J. Fox is the voice of the lead I was it Cree Summer plays his love interest I can't remember I think Garner, James Garner, is the villain. Uh, I like it. And then there's like the, Disney was doing those direct to video sequels throughout like the 90s and the 2000s. And none of, I don't think any of them ended up being any good. And I, I remember watching like part of Milo's return and going like, no, this is just garbage. This is just thrown together in a weekend kind of screenplay bullshit. So I never actually have finished it. But I've watched like, you know, Aladdin 2 and 3 and uh, what was it Fox and the Hound 2 and 
Cinderella 2 and you know Lion King 2 and 1 and a half and all that. I don't like any of those. But I bought this because it had the first Atlantis on it. And then we got a triple feature here, and that is the Austin Powers films. We got Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery, Spy Who Shagged Me, and Gold Member. The only film in this set that I can actually watch and not want to barf is the first film. The first film is genuinely, I think, funny. It was a unique parody of like James Bond stuff and like 60s culture and stuff like that. I thought it was really funny. I think it still is, even though I haven't watched it in probably 10 years. Um, Spy Who Shagged Me I saw in the theater opening weekend, and I thought it was the funniest damn thing I'd ever seen. I remember the scene that was on, was it Jerry Springer, uh, where like, uh, Dr. Evil's fighting with like Scott and all the other people on stage with him. I, I was laughing so hard I couldn't breathe. And then I watched it again when it came out on home video, and I was like, this isn't funny at all. At least to me, I don't think it's funny. And then Gold Member, the only thing I liked about that is the opening where they're making an Austin Powers movie, and like Tom Cruise is playing Austin Powers, and Danny DeVito's playing Mini Me. That stuff I thought was funny, but the rest of the movie, all the jokes that were funny in the first movie are just repeated constantly in these movies. Like the let's hide Austin Powers' wiener with stuff in the foreground of the shot. You know, so we don't have to see his wiener and like, you know, boobs and stuff like that, too. It's just like everything is repeated and it gets sickening to me. Uh, and the funny thing is, I don't know if this is like it happened like this in other other countries. But here, when Austin Powers was first released on DVD, it was put on DVD in the wrong aspect ratio. The movie was shot in 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio, which is the really wide screen and not the size of like a widescreen television. And when it came out on video, they put it in the 1.85 to 1, which is like what a widescreen television is now. Because I remember watching the movie. I saw it twice in the theater. I saw it once in the regular theater, like the opening weekend. And then I saw it on the IMAX uh, over that summer because they had released the movie in IMAX for one night only at the Navy Pier IMAX over here in Chicago. And we went and saw it. And there's a shot in the beginning when Austin Powers is in the casino and someone goes to shoot Austin Powers with an arrow. And Austin Powers like maneuvers a guy in front of him and the arrow hits the guy in the back. Well, you get to see in the theatrical aspect ratio the arrow slam into the guy's back. Full, full in your face. With that aspect ratio that it is on the DVD, you see Austin Powers move the guy and you see him go like this, but you never see the arrow hit him because it's been cut off by the new aspect ratio. And I remember I returned my DVD at least three times saying, like, yeah, there's something wrong with my disc. Like, the aspect ratio is off. And no, it just they put it in the wrong aspect ratio. It was like a printing error or something. I don't know. This is the first time that it's been available in the correct aspect ratio, at least the first one. At least it was on the other set that I have where all three movies were in separate um, DVD cases. And then I found this at Best Buy for, like, 10 bucks. It has all of them in one, you know, Blu-ray size case instead of three. So I bought this to save some space. Getting the kids down to bed. No problem, dude. No problem. Here is a double feature. So one of the things I really like about Screen Factory, which is one of the boutique labels that I've been uh, buying stuff from for over a decade, because they do a lot of genre stuff that I like, like horror movies, science fiction movies, fantasy movies, like thrillers, stuff like that. Uh, they put out like the – I think they, they, they get the rights to a specific movie, and they're like, I think there's an audience out there for it, but I don't think there's a huge audience out there for it. Maybe we should put it on a double feature disc with another movie that's similar. And they did that a lot at the beginning. So I bought this double feature that has Bad Dreams and Visiting Hours. So Bad Dreams is the one that I bought this collection for. It's a ripoff of Nightmare on Elm Street a little bit, but it has like a psychological twist. So uh, there's this girl who actually was in Nightmare on Elm Street 3. She played, uh, was it uh, Jennifer Rubin? She played Taryn, the drug addict. Um, she was in a hippie commune. She was part of a hippie commune when she was young. And uh, the guy that ran it, ended up setting everyone on fire in like this suicide pack thing. And she was the only person who survived and she's been in a coma ever since then. She wakes up now and she's an adult and she's constantly seeing the guy who was the head of the cult trying to kill her and other people in the mental institution she's in because they're like trying to get her to the point where she can actually be okay in society. You know, they're also trying to catch her up to like the 10 years or so that she missed while she was in a coma. Um, the people that are in the mental institution keep on dying and she sees the guy that was the head of the cult killing everybody. And it turns out to be this whole weird psychological thing going on. That's, I think is kind of a cool twist. 
Uh, and it is like a s- typical slasher, and the villain is kind of like Freddy Krueger, where he kind of shows up when she's dreaming, and you know she might be like having like a hallucination in the middle of the day kind of thing, and she sees him, and when she does see him, he's usually like covered, he's burnt to cr- to a crisp, and he's still talking to her. It's okay. It's not as good as I remember it being from back in the day, but I mean, it's still okay. Uh, and then there's Visiting Hours, which is a Canadian slasher movie with Michael Ironside stalking a hospital. It's not that great. I watched it once, and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'll keep it for bad dreams, but Visiting Hours is kind of poopy. <laughs> then we have the Batman Dark Knight Returns Deluxe Edition. This was a movie that was split in half and released on two separate releases like eight months apart. Uh, This is both of them together in one set. So this is the animated version of the Dark Knight Returns comic book or graphic novel that was made by uh, uh, Dick, what's his name, Miller? Frank Miller. I always want to say Dick Miller. Dick Miller is the guy that sent all the Joe Dante movies. Frank Miller. And it's uh, probably one of the best Batman anythings I've ever seen. It's better than a lot of the... It's I think it's almost as good as Dark Knight, you know, the, the Christopher Nolan movie. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's dark. It's like Batman has retired. And uh, he, I think he's been absent for like 20 years or something like that in Gotham. And Gotham is like falling down this... It's like it's under attack almost by these gangs. And uh, Bruce Wayne finally says, you know, the hell with it. I'm coming out of retirement because... What was it? Uh... All of his all of his nemeses have been imprisoned. So, uh, Two Face gets released from Arkham, but then he goes on a killing spree. So that's when Batman decides he's going to come out of retirement to take him down. And that whole scene is awesome. The, the first night that Batman's out on the prowl is one of the coolest things ever, and has an awesome musical score to go along with it. It's very industrial, um, and also sounds like something John Carpenter would probably compose for one of his movies. And then the Joker stages an escape, which is not unlike what you saw in the movie Joker with the talk show thing. And the last part of the movie, the movie's like in chunks. Like the first chunk of the movie is him dealing with his coming out of it, like Bruce Wayne's coming out of retirement and has to take on Two-Face. Second part is him dealing with the gangs that are plaguing Gotham. Third part is him dealing with the Joker escaping and trying to take him out. And then the third part is... Batman, like bat, like superheroes have been like banned. Like Green Land or Green Arrow is like in hiding and all that kind of stuff because he'd be put in jail if he was ever caught. Uh, the only one that's still in action is Superman, and he basically works for the government. And when the president, which I think is Nixon, no, it's Reagan, Reagan in the 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 kind of movie, uh, finds out that Batman is back and is like saying F you to the government for coming out of retirement and being active again. He sixed Superman on him. And then the last chunk of the movie is about Batman versus Superman. And a lot of the stuff from that ended up in the Batman versus Superman movie, which I think is rad. I absolutely love this. It's fantastic. Highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Um, A lot of the Batman movies don't really like it's, it's weird because the animated DC stuff some of them are separate. They're their own thing. They're not connected to anything. And then some of them are part of the DC animated universe, the DC AU. And they all connect and, are, and lead into like a an Infinity War type of movie that's called Apocalypse War. I would say watch this. Watch The Dark Knight Returns. That is This one is absolutely fantastic. Find part one and two. It's great. It's on HBO Max here. If you have it, or H or Max now, I keep on wanting to call it HBO Max. It's just Max. Uh, yeah, if you can watch it on streaming, absolutely. Uh, there's Batman Bad Blood. That one's okay. There's one called uh, There's a Justice League one called Justice League Doom, which is awesome. Where Batman, you find out Batman has files on everyone who's in the Justice League, just in case one of them goes rogue. He knows how to take them out. And the Joker steals that information and starts using it to take out all the people in the Justice League. That one is great. I absolutely love that one. But that the Dark Knight Returns uh, one and two are the ones you need to look at, look for. Then we have the complete collection of Battle Royale. These are Japanese movies. I think they're based on a manga, where it's kind of like the Hunger Games kind of stole the idea of this for their story where 
in Japan to keep the youth in control because they're very rebellious. Uh, once a year, a random class of kids will be selected by the government to be moved to an island where they will have to kill each other until one is left. And it's a way to keep the kids like in line. Like if you are, if your class is being found to be like really bad, maybe you'll get chosen to go to the island next year kind of thing. So it keeps everyone in line. This is about one of them where it goes wrong. And it's very violent, but the violence is real cartoony. It's like CGI blood and stupid shit. Uh, but it's really, really good. And it also has the sequel on here, which is not very good. <laughs> it's very unnecessary. But this has four discs in it. I think it's one is each of the movies, and then... Disc 1 is Battle Royale. Disc 2 is Battle Royale Director's Cut. Disc 3 is Battle Royale 2 Requiem. Disc 4 is the bonus DVD. Yep. I would say watch the first one. The first one is great. Second one, not so much. The first one kind of gets preachy. Yeah, just that other movie, the sequel. I don't really think the sequel is all that great. Yeah, very dramatic death acting. <laughs> that little... That little shootout with all those young girls that have all the machine guns in that, and they're like in that one room, and they're like, oh, we're all best friends, aren't we? Then one of them goes, fuck you, and just starts shooting everybody. <laughs> uh, here is a three-film collection of all the Bill and Ted films. So it's Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Bogus Journey, and Face the Music. I saw Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure in the theater opening weekend, and I thought it was fantastic. I don't like it all that much now. I think it's, out of the three, it's the most dated. Obviously, the newest one came out, like, what, three years ago? Uh, so that isn't very apt for that, but uh, it's still funny. Uh, it's one of the first places I saw Keanu Reeves. I really like Bogus Journey. Bogus, so the, the Excellent Adventure is the one where they go traveling through time, uh, Bill and Ted, and collect a whole bunch of historical figures so they can do a report for their final for high school so they can get a passing grade because they are destined to form a band that will save the world through music, and if they don't pass high school, that will never happen, so... The future decides to lend a hand by giving them a time machine so they can pass their class. Second one is Bill and Ted basically going through the afterlife. They go to heaven and hell. I think that one is more fun and more creative. I think visually it's a lot better. It does a lot of really interesting things with like, what, what do you think heaven would look like? What do you think hell would look like? You know, that kind of stuff. It's great. And then there's like Station, that weird alien with the big ass. <laughs> but I think the thing that makes the second movie so much fun is death. Death is one of the funniest characters in these films. And then we have the third one, which I thought was long overdue, but I'm glad that they got it made, uh, where it's like Bill and Ted are past their prime and they still haven't created that band that's supposed to bring humanity together and save the world. Uh, and it's like time is running out and they need to get their shit together. And it's really funny thing about, you know, getting old and all that and destiny. I think it's great. I missed seeing it in the theater. It was only playing, like it came out like right as... The COVID restrictions were starting to lighten, lighten up a little bit. And it was only playing at like one theater near me. And it was like a good hour and a half drive. And I was like, yeah, I want to see it. But I don't want to see it that bad. So I just waited until it came out on VOD and I rented it. There's another triple feature. All three of the Blade films. We just used this last season on my podcast to watch all three of these movies for our franchise section or our franchise episodes that we do every season. So the first Blade movie is my favorite out of the three. Uh, I saw it in the theater. I had no expectations for it. I, actually, kind of low expectations because the year before, we got Spawn, which was New Line's other superhero movie they tried to make, and I hated Spawn. So when I saw the trailer for Blade, I was like, oh, here we go again. It's got this techno music playing over the trailer, and the, the action looked real choppy, and I was just kind of like, yeah, I don't know about that. But if it, if it comes out during a weekend when nothing else interesting is out, I'll go see it. And I liked it so much. Me and my friends liked it so much that every week after that, like every Friday, we'd be like, okay, what movie's playing? Is there anything that is interesting to any of us? And we'd be like looking at the listings. We'd be like, no, let's just see Blade again. And we would. We did that four weeks in a row. I saw Blade four weeks in a row. I liked it that much. I love the action. I love the soundtrack. I love the visual. Stephen Norrington is a great visual stylist. If you've never seen Death Machine, the movie he made before Blade that got him the job, uh, I highly recommend looking that one up, especially the director's cut version. It's fantastic. It takes superhero movie stuff seriously, even though it has to do with vampires. 
Uh, like the first big Marvel movie that showed that comic book movies could be profitable. And this is what led to the X-Men movie getting made. And it was so good and so profitable that we got a sequel directed by freaking Guillermo del Toro, of all people. And the second one is almost just as good to me. I mean, I like it a lot. Uh, it's just that it repeats stuff from the first movie too much. Like the whole ending of the movie is essentially the first movie all over again. Like, oh, we need Blade's blood. Let's drain him dry. Oh, and then he'll find a way to get some blood back into his system at the end and kick everyone's ass. It's the same stuff. Uh, but it's just as, I think it's almost just as good, like I said. I think the action scenes are actually better in the second one. And uh, I like the makeup of the Reapers, like the new strain of vampire, like the way their jaws come apart and all that. I like that a lot. And then we have the third one, Blade Trinity, which since I loved both of these movies, you have no idea how hyped I was for Blade Trinity. So much so that I had made plans with my friends to go and see the third one opening night. And the thing was, I was so excited about it. I called out of work that day. Went and saw the first screening of the movie of the day. It was like 11 o'clock in the morning. And I was so pissed off when it was over. I called my friends on the way home. And I was like, yeah, you know, we're going to go and see Blade Trinity tonight. They're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, you're on your own. <laughs> and it ended up ruining the night for everybody because nobody ended up going to see it because of me. <laughs> it is so bad. And I think it's all because of the guy who directed it. The guy who, you know, David S. Goyer, who wrote the first two movies also wrote the third one and directed it, and his inexperience shows because I guess he started showing more attention to the new characters that he introduced in the movie, and that's Ryan Reynolds and uh, Jessica Biel, and it pissed Wesley Snipes off to the point that he stopped talking to the director. If he if his face was not being filmed in the shot for the movie, he would not he would stay in his trailer and he'd have a body double being used. He would only talk to the director through Post-it notes. He got into a fist fight with the director at one point. It's just like... It's a mess. And then the ending makes no sense. Like, did he live? Did he die? What is going on? Even the little extended ending thing that they have on here for like a director's cut version still doesn't make any sense. Did he live? Did he die? What is going on? Is there going to be a fourth movie? No, because Wesley Snipes kind of like brushed off these movies. And then not too long after, he went to jail for tax evasion. So I cannot stand the third one, but the first two are freaking classics. There's, there's two Blade games out there. There's Blade 1 for the PS1 and Blade 2 for the PS2 and Xbox. I have both of them. They're not good, but I would never say that they're bad. They're playable. They're fun, but they're not good games. Then I have this Jean-Claude Van Damme double feature. That is two of my favorite Van Damme movies in one, so great. You got Bloodsport and Time Cop. Bloodsport is, I think, the second movie I saw him in. The first movie I saw Van Damme in was... Probably, no, actually, probably the third. This is probably the third, then. First one was definitely Breakin. <laughs> Van Damme is in the first Breakin movie, break, trying to break dance on uh, on the sidewalk and take the, the spotlight away from the people who are actually the break dancers. And they fired him on the spot because he was acting like a fool and doing like backflips and shit. Uh, but you can see him dance in full frame in a couple of shots when the, the first big break dance scene on the uh, beach. Uh, but I remember really taking notice of him in No Retreat, No Surrender, the movie where Bruce Lee's ghost teaches a kid karate so he can beat up his school bully. And then he ends up fighting Van Damme in like a, a boxing ring. Uh, Van Damme was the bad guy in that. And But Bloodsport was like his first starring movie, and it's pretty awesome, even though turns out every single thing that this movie is saying was real was actually complete bullshit. That dude, uh, Dukes, he lied about everything. So this movie is based on bullshit. <laughs> Still a fun movie, though. It's basically Enter the Dragon. Van Damme goes to enter the Kumite, which is a secret fighting tournament in, I think it's in Thailand in the movie. And, uh, yeah, lots of fighting ensues. But Time Cop is awesome. Time Cop is, I think, it shows his, some of his best acting. Uh, but it's based on a Dark Horse comic book where there's, like, time police and they go and look for people who are trying to alter time so that they can possibly gain from something in the future and all that. And uh, he ends up going after this senator who's trying to steal money in the past to fund his presidential race in the future. And it has one of the coolest bad guy deaths ever. The last death like when he takes out the uh, senator, it's one of the coolest things ever. Uh, but I think it's a lot of fun, even though sometimes the rules of the time travel don't make a whole lot of sense. I just think it's a, it's a good time. And then I have another one of those oversized Warner Brothers book things. 
and that is Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, we watched this in my high school film class, and I usually did not care for movies from like this era, like the 60s and the 50s and all that kind of stuff. Uh, did this come out in the 60s or did this come out in the 70s? I think it was in the late 60s. Yeah, I think it was late 60s. But yeah, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. We watched this in class, and I ended up actually really liking it to the point where I wanted to buy a copy of it. But it's a true story of a couple uh, couple that goes uh, bank robbing across the country. And it has another one of those books built into it that has nothing but information about the making of the movie. I had a whole slew of these. I had one of seven. I had one of Poltergeist. I had one of 300. Uh, but I ended up getting rid of them as the 4Ks were coming out. This is one of the only ones I have left with Amadeus and maybe one more. I'm not sure. Maybe I think I have one more. And then we're talking about breaking. In hell. Which one is that? Oh, is that the one where he like kicks the devil in the throat? <laughs> uh, we're talking about breaking. Turns out this was in moratorium when I bought it. So I went to was it the Shout Factory website was uh, sending out emails to people who have bought from their website before saying like, hey, we're like a lot of our titles are going to go out of print. Like we've lost the license to the to make Blu-rays of the of these movies. So whatever we have left in stock is it. So come and get them. We're discounting everything. We just want to get them out of here. And I went to the website a little too late. And a lot of the stuff that I would have bought, like Robot Jocks and this and a couple of other movies were already completely out of stock. And I was like, well, shit. So I went to uh, Amazon and to see if I can get copies of them. And Robot Jocks was going for, I am not kidding, $150. I'm not paying $150 bucks for Robot Jocks. No. Uh, and then this one was going for like 125, and I was like, "There, you could eat my ass." There was no way I'm paying 125 bucks for these two movies. So I'm like, "Well, before I give up, I'll go check eBay." I went and checked eBay. I got this for 25 bucks, <laughs> and that is the Break In and Break In Two double feature. So both of these movies came out in the same calendar year. I think it was like nine months apart. The first Breakin movie turned out to be such a surprise hit that they fast tracked a sequel, and it shows because it does not have a story at all. It's just a bunch of like dance routines and musical numbers and stuff like that. Uh, but the first Breakin, I went back and watched both of these when this showed up because I hadn't seen them since probably 2011. Because I remember I watched both of these after I lost my job in 2011, where I was like unemployed for four months. I was like, I'm gonna go back and watch all these movies for my youth. So I watched these two. I watched Crush Groove. I watched Beat Street. I watched a whole bunch of like those movies from the era, from the eighties, and like Breaking actually still holds up. I think it's 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 goofy and silly, and Van Damme shows up in it for no reason at all, dancing in the sidewalk. Uh, but it's actually not too bad of a movie. The second one, on the other hand, is just like a bunch of bubblegum bullshit. Uh, but the first one is still pretty fun. It actually has a decent amount of extras as well. Commentary with. Uh, the director, guy who directed these, directed Revenge of the Ninja. <laughs> um, and uh, has uh, interviews with the people from the movie, all the actors, both of the breakdancers, the culture that the movie inspired documentary. That's pretty cool. Found this at Half Price Books, and I was like, what the hell? I like the first one. The second one sucks ass. And that is this double feature of the Butterfly Effect films. Uh, I saw the first one. The first one I think is kind of cool, and it's like this this dude who has had a history of blacking out over the course of his life realizes that when he's blacking out, that's when at one point in time he realizes he's able to jump back into him, like into himself in the past and alter parts of his past. And once he realizes he can do that, he starts doing that because his was it he breaks up with his girlfriend. And who he like loves, but she breaks up with him and he wants to go back and try to fix it. And every time he goes back and tries to fix the relationship in the past, he screws something up majorly. Like one of them, he ends up getting hurt and loses both of his arms and legs and ends up as a paraplegic. Uh, one of them, she ends up becoming a drug, uh, drug addict and dies and stuff. And then don't watch the director's cut because in the director's cut, he jumps back into the womb and strangles himself with his umbilical cord. So he's never born. That is freaking stupid. <laughs> and then don't get me uh started on the second movie which is just the same thing all over again 
It has Erica Durant from Smallville in it. She played Lois Lane, and she gets naked in it, and it's the only reason to watch that movie. The movie is directed by the same guy who directed the second Mortal Kombat movie, Mortal Kombat Annihilation, and it's just as bad. And the funny thing is the movie itself of part two is uh, 70 minutes long and then 20 minutes of really slowly scrolling end credits to make it 90 minutes. It is horrible. How that guy keeps getting jobs directing movies, I don't know. So I have this on... This is like a this well. This is a set. It has three films in the in the series, but I have the original movie in 4K in one of these 4K box sets I bought last year. That is the Creature from the Black Lagoon Complete Legacy Collection. This has all three films from the original trilogy. That is Creature from the Black Lagoon, Revenge of the Creature, and The Creature Walks Among Us. I have Creature from the Black Lagoon in 4K on a Universal Monsters 4K set. <clears throat> Too depressing. Yeah, I haven't actually. I haven't watched it. After I after I bought it, I didn't go back and rewatch it because like the thought of that whole thing with the baby like choking himself in the womb with his umbilical cord is like uh, uh, it's so dumb. Uh, the reason I kept this, even though I have it the first movie on 4K, is well it has the other two movies in it, but uh, two of the movies in this series, The Creature from the Black Lagoon and Revenge of the Creature, are in 3D, so I can watch these in my 3D uh, or my uh, PSVR headset. So that's the only reason I've kept this is I've never actually watched these in 3D. This is still sealed. <laughs> I should probably open it at some point and check them out. But yeah, I have never seen these movies in 3D, so that's why I got it. Here's another one of those Screams Shout Factory double features. Bought it for one, still haven't seen the other movie. And this is Crime Zone. Got the hiccups all of a sudden. Crime Zone and Future Kick. I bought it for Future Kick. So, Future Kick is by um, Roger Corman's company, New Horizons, and it stars Don the Dragon Wilson, who was trying to be the next Van Damme. It just didn't happen. You know, him and Jeff Speakman never happened for either of them. Uh, and it's a cyberpunk sci-fi movie, so it's kind of like the Terminator. Even the cover makes it look kind of like the Terminator. Uh, what's the description? Join action superstar Don the Dragon Wilson in this Far-flung future of 2025. Oh, shit, it's going to happen next year. Uh, where man is the victim of his own technology and corporations deal in black markets that trade in human body parts, which is very repo the genetic opera and cyberpunk kind of thing. And uh, I remember he uses special effects scenes from Battlestar, or not Battlestar Galactica, Battle Beyond the Stars and some other New Horizons movies. But I remember it being pretty cool, and there was a director's cut of the movie on here, which I've never seen. I should probably crack this open and watch it. I might bring it to the uh, convention this weekend so we can watch it at uh, my buddy Ryan's house that I'm going to stay at this weekend. Crime Zone, I've never actually seen. It's another New Horizons movie. Uh, it says, The legendary David Carradine stars in this sci-fi actioner as Jason, a mysterious stranger who recruits a pair of young lovers to commit a crime spree in a futuristic police state, promising them the only thing that matters, escape. And it looks really super cheap. But then again, both of these movies are really super cheap. So... Yeah, I'm going to put that one aside after uh, the stream is over and bring it to Ryan's house this weekend. Then we got this classic series. So this is from Scream Factory as well. They release like these big box sets sometimes of like multiple movies in a franchise. So I picked up the Critters Collection. First two Critters movies are some of my favorite movies from my childhood. I watched, like we weren't, a lot, I, I say this a lot when I talk about films. I was not allowed to watch horror movies when I was a kid. Like my parents thought it would break my brain and my brother's brain. But we could watch The Terminator. We could watch Predator. We could watch uh, Commando. We could watch Arnold Schwarzenegger hack people up like Jason Voorhees does in his movies. But we can't watch Jason Voorhees hack people up, up in those movies. Logic. So, like, if it was PG-13 and it was on cable in the middle of the day, like, you know, these were, it was okay, even though there is some graphic stuff going on in it. But it's kind of like a rip-off. It was not designed to be a rip-off of Gremlins. This was in production before Gremlins was. Uh, but the first Critters movie is little alien balls of fur that are always hungry land on Earth and start eating up a small town. <laughs> and then a the bunch of alien bounty hunters show up to stop them. It's really fun. I like the design of the aliens. The movie is fun. That little, that one scene where... <laughs> There's two critters sitting on the porch of the main character's house, the people that they've been attacking the whole time. Uh, there's two critters sitting on the, the porch, and they're like, well, 
the door is closed. What are we going to do? And everyone goes, I don't know. And then you see the door kind of open up a little bit, and a shotgun barrel comes through and shoots and blows one of them up. And the other one looks at the remains of his friend and goes, fuck. <laughs> that still cracks me up. And then we have the sequel, which I actually ended up seeing in the theater. My parents let us go see this in the Dollar Theater. And it's just as fun. Uh, it's directed by Mick Garris, who I think is a complete hack. Because after this, all he decided to do was direct Stephen, Stephen King adaptations and real bad ones at that. This one is actually pretty fun, and it's more funny than the first one. And then we have the other two, which went direct to video. So we have Critters 3. Do these have subtitles? Critters 3, you are what they eat. And Critters 4, they're invading your space. Critters 3 has Leonardo DiCaprio in it. It was like his first movie. And it all takes place inside of an apartment building because uh, all of these movies are linked. Like, there's stuff that happens at the end of one movie that leads into the next one, because there's always, like, some eggs left over of the Krites and stuff. Yeah, and this one takes place in an apartment building that is under attack by the Critters. Leonardo DiCaprio is one of the kids in the building. Blah, blah, blah. It's okay. And then at the end of the third one, it ends in a cliffhanger, because there's this character, Charlie, who's been in all of these movies so far. He's one of the bounty hunters. He gets, like, cryogenically frozen at the end of the third movie, and it he ends up being thawed out in the future in part four, which takes place in outer space where horror franchises go to die. <laughs> and uh, this one actually stars Angela Bassett in one of her first movie roles. And Brad Dorff is in it too. It has a pretty decent cast. Uh, it's just that there isn't a whole lot going on. It's This is the only one that I think is rated... No, this one's still PG-13. This one is violent as all hell for a PG-13 movie. This one's actually gory, like really gory. But it's definitely better than the third one. It's just a little slow, and it kind of has a definitive ending at the end. So all four of these Critter movies. There's another one that came out not too long ago called Critters Attack or something like that that was made for Sci-Fi Channel. And then there was like a Critters TV show that was going to be coming out, but I don't think it actually did. I still haven't seen the new one, that Critters Attack or whatever. I hear it's absolute trash. Super fun, great B-movie. Yeah, I love them. I mean, the third one, even though it's, it, I think it's pretty bad, it's still pretty fun. It's funny watching uh, Leonardo DiCaprio on that. I know he like does not like talking about the fact that he was in it when he gets interviewed. <laughs> Here's another one of those Scream Factory double features. This one has two movies by Empire Pictures. And I'm going to talk about them in great length in a minute. Empire Pictures was the previous iteration of what is now Full Moon Entertainment, Charles Band. Uh, he made nothing but theatrical, like really cheap theatrical movies in the 80s. And then at the very end of the 80s, he decided to get a little too uh, ambitious, I guess, and bankrupted his studio with two movies that cost a ton of money and bombed. And then ended up forming Full Moon, which focused specifically on making direct-to-video genre movies that were cheap to make and that is still what he's doing now uh and these two movies are from the empire library and that is the dungeon master and eliminators so dungeon master is an anthology film about this computer geek who has created this like artificial intelligence that talks to him through his watch and is like it, it, it's basically like a siri kind of thing or a uh, alexa and uh, he gets the attention of this being. I can't remember what the stupid dude's name is. Doesn't say what his name is. He has like some weird name, but he's like Lucifer. Uh, and he keeps on pitting this computer geek against, like, and he throws him into different scenarios to see if he can actually beat them. And if he wins all of these, he gets his girlfriend back kind of thing. And like it there each one of the little segments is directed by somebody different. So it's it's like your a true anthology film. It's not that great. <laughs> I know Wasp the band shows up in one of the uh the shorts and all that but like a lot of them reuse special effects from other movies like there's this there's like this uh post-apocalyptic situation that he gets thrown into and it reuses all the footage from Metal Storm that the lead guy who plays the computer geek was in the year before. Um, there's a couple that have some stop motion anim animation by the guy who did the animation for Gumby. Um, there's one that I, and I shit you not last 45 seconds and it has a little troll that gives a little riddle and the guy beats it like on the first try and he's like, okay, you're good. It's not that great. Uh, 
Eliminators, on the other hand, I saw in the theater. My mother took me and my brother to see it at the Dollar Theater. And it's kind of like a poor man's version of Magnificent Seven. So this dude who is dying of like a, some weird disease has created a time machine. And he wants to go back in time to not only heal himself, but like you find out he wants to rule over history. And he has created this like android person who is partially the remains of a military pilot who crashed on the island where he's doing his experiments. And he turned what was left of him into this like android that has like tank legs and different interchangeable arms that have different weapons on them and all that. And he goes rogue when he finds out what's going on and finds a whole bunch of different people to help him out. He finds this woman who is like a scientist who has this little R2-D2 robot um that uh can zip around and he's kind of like rte is basically r2d2 just this big there's like a boat pilot that acts like han solo there's a ninja <laughs> and they all go back to take out the uh the, the scientist guy that's created the time machine before he can screw up history and it's stupid and it's cheesy and it's cheap but it's a lot of fun and i think it still holds up i watched it like two years ago and i was like i actually am still enjoying this even though it's kind of shitty Denise Crosby, who played Tasha Yar in Star Trek The Next Generation, is in this. She plays the computer expert who created a little R2-D2 robot. It's fun. It's goofy. It's silly, but I, I enjoy it. And then we're getting into some serious shit. We've got the Dragon Tattoo Trilogy. This is the original Swedish ones. Uh, this is the extended cuts of all three of the movies. So it's funny when you realize that these movies that... Uh, we know here that came out theatrically here were actually television movies in Sweden. <laughs> and uh, they were like over multiple nights. So that's why there's this extended edition. When they released the movies here theatrically, they condensed them a little bit to make them move a little faster. But these are the TV cut versions of the girl with the dragon tattoo, the girl who played with fire and the girl who kicked the hornet's nest. And there is a documentary that's all about the trilogy as well. Numi Rapace or Rapace or Rapache, I don't know how to say her last name, kicks total ass in these movies. Open it up, and you've got some pictures of the main characters. And Michael Blomquist. And the films. And I watched the first movie on Netflix streaming. And I was I remember a lot of people were talking about it. It was like it was at the kind of like the peak of its popularity. And everybody was talking about it. I was like, fine, I'll freaking watch this damn movie. And I watched it, and I was like, holy shit. That was kind of amazing. I did not see where that movie was going to go. And the shit that went on in it, I was just like, wow, that was really hard to watch. But that movie is freaking awesome. To the point where I found out that the following day was going to be the premiere of the second movie, uh, The Girl Who Played With Fire, uh, playing at the local indie theater. So the next day, I went and saw the sequel, which I was not all that impressed with because all of a sudden it felt really cheap and cheesy. And all of a sudden the main characters got this like brother who is like a boxing prodigy and is super strong. And it's like, when did this become the X-Men? <laughs> it's like, this is stupid. And then I saw the third movie when it was released and it's kind of, it's a courtroom movie and it's not all that great. And I was kind of disappointed. The first movie is kind of where it's at, but the other two, not so much. I wish we did get remakes of the other two movies as well, but we didn't. And then we're talking about Full Moon Films. You know, Empire Films turned into Full Moon. Here is one of the multiple movie packs that they released. And it's the Dollman Action Pack. But this has Dollman, Demonic Toys, and then Dollman versus Demonic Toys. So it's the Dollman slash Demonic Toys set. So Dollman is Tim Thomerson from the Trancers movies, who was like the hero of Full Moon at that point in time. Like he, If he was in one of the Full Moon movies, it was usually going to be pretty fun. Um, plays this alien cop who comes to Earth, and on Earth, people from his planet are 13 inches tall. So he starts getting the reputation of the doll man, and he's chasing like this alien drug dealer from his planet who is basically a little head on whose body, whose head is the head is sitting on a drone. <laughs> it floats around and just talks shit. <laughs> and that guy, it was named Droog, I think, or, or Sprug, hooks up with a drug dealer in, on Earth played by Jackie Earl Haley, who was an Oscar nominee, guy who played Freddy Krueger in the remake of Nightmare on Elm Street, hooks up with him, and they start trying to cause shit in the hood. Dollman ain't having it. The cool thing about Dollman is his gun on his planet 
is the most powerful handgun in the world. You see him holding it right there. On his planet, if he shoots you with it, you explode. <laughs> on our planet, he shoots you with it. It blows a hole in you, and then it starts to rot you from the inside out. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And then we have Demonic Toys, which is a different take on the Puppet Master movies. Instead of it being living puppets, it's living toys that are possessed by demons. And they're running around a toy warehouse, killing all the people that happen to walk in the damn place. Yeah, there's a cop and her partner go in there to look for a murder suspect who's hiding in the building. And then they end up getting in the crossfire. And there's this homeless woman that lives in the vents. And then there's the pizza delivery guy who's stuck there. And there's a security guard, too. And it's really silly. David S. Goyer, who I just said wrote the, the Blade movies, was one, of the, was one of the first movies he wrote was Demo, uh, Demonic Toys. And then we have the combo movie, Dollman vs. Demonic Toys. Before you had Batman vs. Superman, you had Dollman vs. Demonic Toys. The movie is like 65 minutes long, and it's essentially Doll Man teams up with the cop from the first uh, Demonic Toys movie. They go back to the toy factory to take out the Demonic Toys once and for all, and uh, Doll Man hooks up with this other girl who's from another movie in the Full Moon Library called, uh, what is it, Bad Channels, where aliens come down and start to, uh, was it, hypnotize women through the radio? And they shrink them down to like 13 inches so they can take them back to their planet. And one of the girls survived the end of that movie and she is now going to be Dollman's love interest. So it's like he's doing it for her and he's doing it for the cop because, you know, I can respect the cop. And it's silly and stupid and dumb, but it's fun. And it just it's over before you know it because, like I said, it's only like 65 minutes long. But it's cool that they were creating like an in- like a like a full moon universe thing where everything was kind of connected to the point where I was talking with another YouTuber uh, about writing an Avengers version of that where it's like all the different movies from the full moon universe coming together in some way and I thought I came up with a clever way of doing it and so did he just we didn't we just stopped talking after a while uh then I have the four or sorry five movie die hard collection and the reason I have this and I have not bought the, the first Die Hard movie on 4K is this has this is the only way you can get the R-rated cut of Live Free or Die Hard on Blu-ray. So this has the first three movies. You know, you got Die Hard, Die Hard 2, Die Harder, and Die Hard with a Vengeance. Die Hard with a Vengeance is actually my favorite out of all of them. I know everyone's like, Die Hard, Die Hard. I like the, th the third one the most because that one's different or I tried to do something different. Live Free or Die Hard was cut down to PG-13. Doll Man sounds bonkers. It is, but it's a lot of fun. I'd, I'd recommend looking it up. If you have Tubi where you are, Tubi, the streaming service, it's it's on there. Um, so Live Free or Die Hard was cut down to be PG-13 to make more money because it had been a long time since the Die Hard movie came out. Die Hard 3 came out in 95, and Live Free or Die Hard came out in, like, 2007 or something. So and it had been a while, so they were like, let's try to rake in as much money as we can. Let's make it PG-13. So they filmed the movie to be R-rated, but in post-production, they like cut out all the swears and redubbed swears and cut out a lot of the violence. Uh, and then on DVD, there was the unrated cut, but we never got it on Blu-ray. This is the only way you can get the unrated Blu-ray cut, or the unrated cut is on this Blu-ray set. So there's that. And then there's the th fifth movie, A Good Day to Die Hard, which we don't talk about in this house. <laughs> And then I have this double feature, the two Crocodile Dundee movies. These are two movies that I watched a ton when I was a kid. I remember when the first Crocodile Dundee movie came out, every single person I knew was talking about how great it was. So my parents, what's up, man, boy cave? My parents were like, hey, let's go see that Crocodile Dundee movie. And I was just like, I don't know, it sounds kind of dumb. I'm like, I don't really care about, you know, some Australian guy coming to New York. I mean, uh, what? Like, what, what's going to be great about that? But we went to see it anyway, and I loved it. I ended up loving it. It's really funny. It's a, it's actually kind of a decent love story. It's fish out of water thing to be, you know, for sure. But it's really entertaining and really well made. And then the sequel decided to go the aliens route and turns this, like, romantic comedy fish out of water story into an action movie. Where, like, Crocodile Dundee gets involved with drug dealers in New York and has to go back to the Outback in order to hide from them and the drug dealers follow them and it turns into like, I'm going to use this environment which I've been living in my whole life against you since you don't know a goddamn thing about how this works. 
And I actually do like the second one. I think it's really fun. I think that's a great soundtrack. Um, it's not nearly as funny as the first one, and it does focus more on the drug dealer stuff than anything else. But it's entertaining. I do enjoy it quite a bit. The funny thing is, like, when I found this at Half Price Books, what was the first movie that I popped into my Blu-ray player? Part two. <laughs> but I, I really like Paul Hogan. I think he's really relatable. He seems like he's a really cool guy. He's funny. And he's like a natural actor. I'd never heard of Paul Hogan before these movies. But, like, I wish we'd got more stuff with him in it that just didn't have to do with Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, the cool thing about Die Hard 4 was, I guess... They were told to cut down on the violence to begin with. And in place of like the violent shootouts and everything, they focused mostly on really cool stunts. And like that car chase scene, the stuff that takes place in the tunnel uh, between, was it New York and New Jersey, is great. Especially when he like launches the car at the helicopter. That thing with the plane at the end is, is stupid as hell, but it's really cool and it's really well choreographed. Like the stunts and the action scenes in that movie are great. Uh, but when you put all the action, the violence and the swearing back in, it actually, it's a lot better, <laughs> but I really like, I really like the set the fourth one. I, I think it does not get a lot of credit. Uh, I wish it did got, uh, I wish it did get more recognition for being a fun action movie. Definitely better than part two and anything is better than part five. There is no Die Hard five. You ain't kidding. <laughs> so we're talking about empire. Empire was really big in the 80s, and they made a lot of really interesting low-budget movies that ended up making a profit because they were so cheap to make. Well, a lot of their movies aren't available on Blu-ray. They're on most of them. I think the majority of them you can find on DVD, but Blu-ray, not so much. Arrow, which is a boutique label from the UK, got together and they only managed to get what five five of the movies together for this set the set that they call the empire of screams <clears throat> and you can see all the different characters from the movies here you got robot jocks characters uh you got stuff from uh dungeon master uh cellar dweller you got dolls i already showed that more characters from Dolls, one of the characters from Arena. And on the back, it just has information all about that. But actually, you take the slip off, and you got the Cellar Dweller, and you got Excalibrate from Dungeon Master. So this does have a double in it. So the movies that are in this set are the Dungeon Master, again, what can you do? I would get rid of my set, but that has Eliminators on it. And until I can get Eliminators somewhere else, I'm going to keep that double pack. Dolls which is one of the movies I was looking for in the moratorium movies on that sale where I was looking for breaking and all that. Dolls was going for 150 bucks. Cellar Dweller, which has never been on Blu-ray. Arena, which has never been on Blu-ray. And Robot Jocks was the other one I was looking for in that moratorium sale that was going for like 150 bucks on Amazon. So to get this set for like $70 and have five movies in it, a lot of them are worth a lot more individually. Um, yeah, you bet your ass I bought this. And this opens up, and you have the five movies. So you got Robot Jocks, which is in the future after, like, the USA and Russia got into, like, a nuclear war. In the future, we fight battles over territory by using giant mechas, like, you know, Jaegers from Pacific Rim to fight. <laughs> That's the whole gist of that. Arena is like Enter the Dragon, but in outer space. There's, like, this space station where they have a, like, a, a extra terrestrial boxing arena and it like has a huge betting culture and a, a human has not been able to survive in the ring for like decades or something or a century or something or whatever it is and then this guy shows up that turns out to be like a human fighter that's worthy uh then there's cellar dweller which is about a comic book monster that comes to life in an apartment building dolls is just like puppet master you know uh, what's his name? Charles Band, who owned Empire and Full Moon, is obsessed with like little things like dolls and toys coming to life. But it's the same kind of thing. Some like this, this like family, their car breaks down in the middle of like the UK wilderness, and they find this like house that's occupied by this old couple, and the whole house is filled with little porcelain dolls. But they come to life, and if they don't like you, they will kill you. <laughs> and then we have Dungeon Master again. 
and it also comes with this pretty thick book that's all about all the different movies in here. Pretty cool. I saw Robot Jocks in the theater. Robot Jocks is really fun. It has Gar Gary Graham in it, who just died recently. Uh, he was from the Alien Nation television show. But it's a pretty cool set, and it sold out. Like, I bought it off of Amazon. I pre-ordered it off of Amazon, like, when it first went up for sale. And it sold out, like, instantly. And I was lucky that I got a copy of it. I think now they have, like, other – they have, like, a reprint that they've done. So if you still want it, you can get it. Uh, then here's another big box set from Scream Factory, but this is all the Fly movies. This is the uh, the Fly collection. This has all five of the movies that were made in the Fly series, starting with the original, the Fly that has Vincent Price in it. Actually, a pretty decent horror movie, except in in this one, like when the dude creates the tele this dude's creating a teleporter machine, and he experiments on himself, and a fly gets in the teleporter with him. And in the original one, when he goes through, his head and his arm turn into a fly, a giant fly arm and leg, or arm, head and head and leg. Sorry, head and arm. Bleh. And there's also a fly buzzing around that has a human head and a human arm on it. <laughs> to that whole like, ah, thing from the end of the movie. <laughs> and it's actually not too bad. It's actually really good for like an old 50s horror movie. And then we have these sequels that I've never seen. There's Return of the Fly. His uncle. Oh, uh, Vincent Price isn't the guy who does the experiment. Vincent Price is like the best friend of the dude who does the experiment. Uh, he warns his nephew not to look into the teleportation experiments, and the same thing happens. And Oh, another fly got in there. Yeah, oh, sure. I'm, I bet. And then there's Curse of the Fly, which I've never actually watched. But I'm pretty sure that's going to be garbage. But then we have the ones from the 80s. So we have the Fly remake by David Cronenberg starring uh, Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis. And this movie is absolutely freaking fantastic, if you ask me. I absolutely love it. And this was one of those movies. So in the U.S., back in the day, back in the late 80s, we had a channel on cable that showed nothing but trailers for movies that were available on pay-per-view. And my brother and I would sit there and just watch that trailer channel for hours. I remember there was the trailer for The Fly. There was the trailer for one of the Hell the first Hellraiser movie. They actually had like a chunk of the movie from Hellraiser. The trailer for Jaws the Revenge. Uh, Deadly Friend. I remember we would just watch it over, like the trailers over and over again. We thought trailers were super cool. And I remember watching the trailer for this each time and going like, I want to know what's going on in that movie, but mom and dad will never let us watch it because it's it's gross. It's a horror movie. And eventually we like, my parents rented it, made a copy of it, and then you don't leave copies of these movies out for curious children to, to find. And we found it and we watched it and I was like, holy shit, that movie was disgusting, but it was awesome. Jeff Goldblum was nominated for an Oscar, I do believe, for this and he deserves it. Gina Davis is good in it. The makeup effects are freaking phenomenal. It's all like physical effects and all that. It is nasty as all hell. It's great. It is fantastic. And then we have the sequel. And this one I actually saw in the theater. We, my parents took us to see this in the Dollar Theater because at that point we were allowed to watch horror movies. And this one is all about Jeff Goldblum's kid who was conceived while he had or after he had gone through the teleporter with the fly. And in this, this version of The Fly, it's a gradual transformation, not like an instantaneous transformation like in the old one. He is slowly turning into a fly-human hybrid thing. Uh, he just didn't know that it was happening when he impregnated Gina Davis's character. And his son has like genetic diseases after he's born because of this. And eventually he morphs into a giant fly monster that sprays acid saliva in people's faces, and that their faces completely fall off kind of stuff. It's cool. It's not bad. It has great makeup effects and uh, physical effects and all that. It's just not that. It when compared to the first one, it's just kind of like it's an imitation. But this one has Eric Stoltz in it as the lead, and it's fun. I mean, I still like it. I still have nostalgic memories of it because it was like one of the first horror movies I was allowed to see in a theater. 
and all that, but I would definitely watch the first one over the sequel any day. Robojock needs a remake or a sequel. Absolutely. Spray for bugs. <laughs> Koga's made a lot of movies in Australia over the years, but they don't have much international appeal. I know he did. He did three Crocodile Dundee movies. The third one was like Crocodile Dundee, Dundee in L.A. or something. I never bothered watching that one. I know he did all, one called Almost an Angel or something like that. And I think he was in a couple of other movies, but I don't really... Like, a bunch of director video stuff I remember he did. We have a big one here. This is another one of those big box sets from uh, Scream Factory. It's got a little dusty. Excuse me. And that is the Friday the 13th Deluxe Edition Collection. This thing is a beast. I love that artwork. Has the Jason looks from every single movie that is included in this set on here somewhere. If you ordered this through Shout Factory or Scream Factory, you got, if you're like one of the first, I don't know, a couple thousand people, you got a, ra a poster that is this entire image, like this big widescreen poster. I don't know if I'd hang that up. <laughs> but this has every Friday the 13th movie that's ever been made, plus an extra one. So, what does it have? Let me take these out of here. Come on. You can do it. Come on. There we go. So, we got the OG Friday the 13th. Uh, camp counselors being stalked by somebody and they get murdered one by one. Original. <laughs> uh, the This is the first one. It It is more of a horror mystery. It's like you don't know who's doing the killing. There's a lot of talk about Jason and all that, but Jason's dead, right? Turns out it's Jason's mom kind of like snapped and went after all the camp counselors that she still perceives killed her kid back in the 50s <clears throat> by stalking all these new camp counselors in the 80s. Dick move. Uh, but Tom Savini did the special effects for it. It's really, it's really well done, except for the, the beheading at the end. The beheading at the end, you can see the toothpicks in the neck hole that were holding the head in place before the head got knocked off the shoulders. <laughs> but outside of that, I think it's okay. For like the first movie in a franchise, I'm like, yeah, it's all right. But this was like a massive, massive hit. So naturally we get sequel, which I think is superior to the first one because the uh, final girl in this one, Ginny, I think is a great character. She's actually really well developed. She's got, she's smart. She thinks on her, you know, she, She's quick thinking when she realizes she's got a problem that needs solving. It's, I really, really like her. Uh, more of the same, but this is the first one where Jason is the killer. It turns out he really wasn't dead. He's just been living like a hillbilly out in the woods. <sighs> and he's got a burlap sack on his head in this one, which is actually kind of a scary look when you see it in action. But when they take his, hat, his uh, hood off at the end, that makeup effect is pretty cool uh, when you see it like full on your face like in the last shot. But I prefer this one to the first one. It is uh, pretty rad. And then we have the third one, part three in 3D. And I used to love this one when I was a kid because of all the stupid 3D effects and how they look in 2D. Like the one dude gets his head squeezed like this and then his eyeball pops out toward the screen. You watch it now and it's like, this is so stupid. The thing was, as an adult, when I watched the third one, is I find it super freaking boring. There's all these long, lingering shots of just, like, nothing. So there's, like, a shot of the main characters when they're on their way to their vacation house. Uh, and they're they're driving down, like, a main street in their minivan, or their, their conversion van. And the camera, like, follows them as they're driving down the road. And then they're just driving. The camera just lingers on them as they're just going down the road for, like, a good minute. I'm like, what is the point of this shot? Like, you're just dread. Nothing happens. There's no like boo scare or anything. It's just this long, drawn out shot, and they do that a lot. Like, they're just like somebody's walking, and they just follow them as they're walking into the background for like a minute. It's like, what are you doing? Like pacing. It's a thing. Well, the thing is, I've never actually watched this movie in 3D before, and this movie was designed, you know, to be, you know, take advantage of everything the 3D can do, right? It was also a pioneering movie when it came to 3D. They developed a new th method of shooting 3D movies just for this. So when I finally watched this in 3D, because it had this is the first time this has been available in true 3D 
since its theatrical release. Uh, and you can watch it in my PS. I watched it in my PSVR headset. So now that I've actually watched this in 3D, all those long, boring, lingering shots make perfect sense. They're trying to do the whole depth of field thing because all the stuff that's in the foreground is separate from all the stuff in the background, and it looks really cool. So that time we're in 2D, I'm sitting there going like, what am I supposed to be looking at here? There is nothing going on. It's just watching this van drive down the road into the background. But when I'm watching it in 3D, I'm sitting there going like all over the frame, going like, wow, that's like right in my face, and that's like midway between the background and the foreground. I'm like, this is really cool. And that was what they were trying to do. All the 3D effects work really well. The eyeball popping, Jason shooting the uh, harpoon at the camera, all that kind of stuff. It works. So now the movie is actually pretty fun to watch for me as long as I'm watching in 3D. In 2D, not so much. The movie itself is kind of poopy. <laughs> it's really badly acted. Um, and this is the first movie where Jason gets his hockey mask. That's where that whole thing started. And the thing was, this was supposed to be the final movie in the series. The movie, this series was developed to be a trilogy. Jason getting the machete through his shoulder in the second movie wasn't supposed to kill him. It was supposed to maim him. And then in this one, he gets the axe in the head at the end of the movie. We get the little full circle thing with Jason's mom popping out of the water and pulling the girl into the, the, the water, and then she ends up going crazy at the end. It was supposed to be the end of the movie, or the end of the series, because at the end of the movie, there is no boo scare of Jason getting back up. They just zoom in on his body laying there in the barn, and it was supposed to end there. But this made so much goddamn money that they were like, I guess we got to make a new one. So they made the final chapter... I hate this one. I really do. This one is like, yes, these are slasher movies and they're about people being killed, but this one is so mean spirited. Like every character in this movie is unlikable. Uh, what was that? That dead fuck guy. There's the Crispin Glover. There's like those twins. I don't like any character in this movie. Even Corey Feldman is annoying as all hell. The, the stupid idiot hitchhiker guy who's looking for his dead sister from the first movie when he's getting stabbed at the end of the movie in the basement, he's going, he's killing me! He's killing me! He's killing me! It's What? What? What is going on? It is just over-the-top gory, and it is just, like I said, really mean-spirited, and I don't like it. And sure, this one does kind of have a definitive ending when it comes to, like, Jason. The Jason gets hacked up to nothing at the end of this. But there's the whole, like, doo -doo -doo thing where, oh, is is Corey Feldman's character going to become the new Jason? Because at the end of the movie, he seemed kind of like open his eyes in this weird, creepy way. Eh, well, guess what? That was what was supposed to happen because they're going to keep going with this franchise no matter what, as long as he's made money. So then we get A New Beginning, which is supposed to be the movie where we watch uh, Corey Feldman's character, Tommy Jarvis, lose his mind and become the new Jason. So because of what happened in the fourth movie... Tommy Jarvis gets sent to this like rehabilitation center that's like out in the country, like out in the rural area with a bunch of other mentally uh, disturbed people. And he's like, he's going to try to get, you know, get some help finally because of, you know, he watched all this bullshit happen in the uh, fourth movie. And then some Jason copycat shows up and starts killing everybody at the, at the halfway house. And it's at the end of the movie, it turns out it's like this random ambulance driver that cracked and went crazy and whatever. This movie's mostly about boobs <laughs> and that stupid girl robot dancing for no reason, which is dumb. But at the end of the movie, like you see Tommy Jarvis put on like the hockey mask and go after somebody with a knife. And it's like, Oh, it's supposed to go that direction. Tommy's the new bad guy. Well, this movie didn't make a whole lot of money because of that. So they decided to go back to Jason being the killer for part six Jason lives and they resurrect him like Frankenstein by having him get electrocuted to the point where he comes back to life. So now Jason is a completely overpowered zombie. This is also one of the most fun movies in the franchise because this was treated very tongue in cheek. Like the guy who wrote it, the guy who directed it, Tom McLaughlin, he knew that the whole premise of this was stupid and he rolls with it. And he like, there's like the really weird sense of humor going through the whole movie and it actually makes the movie more fun. This one is so much enter or so entertaining to watch. I cannot tell you. Uh, there's a lot of really cool kills in it. There's a lot of meta humor in it. This one is kind of like the first version of Scream because characters are actually kind of aware of what's going on, especially like the kids. This is the first movie that actually has kids at the summer camp when Jason's stalking around. He doesn't actually kill any of the kids, but there's like a bunch of kids that are like aware of what's happening. So when Jason's like stalking the camp at the end of the movie, 
all the kids in their like bunk room are hiding under the beds. And one of them looks at the other one and goes, so what were you going to be when you grew up <laughs> and stuff? And like one of the girls is, is like reading a Nietzsche book about like existentialism and all that, you know, what happens after death and all that. This one is like really fun to watch. And I, I, I probably out of like two other movies in this series, I watched this one probably the most. My all-time favorite is Part 7. This is the first movie in the series I ever saw. Uh, ended up, my parents were away for a night. They went to, like, see a play or something. And this just happened to come on at 7 o'clock on HBO or Cinemax or whatever it was. And I was like, well, Mom and Dad aren't home. Guess what I'm watching? And there's a recap of the sixth movie at the start of this one. And I thought that was so cool, the stuff that they show from Part 6, that... Once my parents found out that I had watched this, I was like, can you do me a favor and go out and rent me a copy of part six so I can watch that like right now? <laughs> uh, but this is the one where it's Jason against Carrie, you know, a, a girl with psychic powers, and she whoops his ass in this movie, and it is so much fun. A lot of the characters are unlikable. Some of the characters are likable. There's a really evil doctor in this movie. There's a real son of a bitch. But like the look of Jason in this one, because in this one, Jason's been like underwater for a decade, and he's like rotted, and all that, and he's still a zombie, but he gets resurrected again and goes on another killing spree. And the kills in this are brutal. But this is also one of those movies that got cut to pieces by the MPAA uh, for violence. They were like really cracking down on horror movies, like in 1987 or eight when this came out. So like a lot of the kills, you see it start happening, and then like it kind of cuts away. Like there's this one dude who Jason grabs his head like from the top and from his chin and was supposed to crush it like a beer can. And you see it start, you see him start doing it and you see blood start to run down the guy's head. And then they just focus on Jason's mask and you hear, <laughs> they actually showed pictures of like him actually crushing this dude's head like a beer can. And it was actually kind of a funny accordion looking effect. Uh, one other dude got a ax. He like an underhand swing of an ax right to his face. And it, the way it cut his face, it was supposed to be kind of funny because it looked like a VJ when you got the close-up of it. A lot of really cool kills in it, but that just got taken apart by the uh, MPAA. But this one is my favorite to watch. I think it's the most fun because it's probably the most ridiculous. They didn't they, they didn't have that in mind first. Wait, what was that? Did they have a sequel in mind when they made the first? No, they didn't have a sequel in mind when they made the first, but it made like such a huge amount of money they couldn't not make a sequel. And then that made a ton of money, and then they made the third one, and even though it was supposed to end at the third one, that made even more money because of being in 3D. So they're like, okay, we'll make a fourth one. Well, guess what? The fourth one made even more money, so we're going to make another one, even though we called this one the final one, but you know, whatever. <laughs> this, I want to say, part seven is when they started to like lower in box office profit. That's when the, you can tell that they they were trying to use gimmicks to bring back the audience that they were losing with each movie. So, like, I think part, part five kind of soured it for everybody. Part six, I think the profits went up a little bit, which is why they made a seventh one, even though the seventh one I think is the most fun to watch and is the most creative. Um, it, the profits went down for that. So they try to do something different for the next one to bring in more people, and that's Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. So they're like, oh, the whole gimmick of Jason in the big city will bring bring people in. Nope. They made even less money than the seventh one. And for good reason, because this I did see in the theater. This is the first slasher movie I saw in the theater. And uh, my brother and I were really excited because we both loved Part 7, like I've said. And when it was over, we are like, that was the worst freaking thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, the title is Jason Takes Manhattan. He's in Manhattan for literal Manhattan for 45 seconds. The rest of it is like Calgary, doubling as New York. And what do they do when they're in, uh, when they're in Manhattan? They're running around the sewers. It is dumb. Like the, the kills are really cheap and cheesy. The guy who directed this movie was directing nothing but TV at the time, and it's like he he does not know how to work with actors. The acting in this movie is terrible. Uh, the kills are shitty. The way Jason gets taken out at the end of the movie is one of the dumbest things ever. Um, although Kane Hodder came back from Part Seven to play Jason again, and he's great because he lo that body language thing he's got going on is great. But it's just it's terrible. It is so bad. Only kill in this movie that I think was worth it was the up the uppercut head, you know, decapitation. That's it. But after watching that, I was just kind of like, wow, I really got into these Friday the thirteenth movies like really quickly. Like I saw the seventh one, I was like, I need to watch the rest of them. And then this one made me not like them. <laughs> I was like, you know what? 
if it ends here, I think I'll be okay with it. <laughs> but apparently New Line was like, hey, we have an idea. We want to – we just killed off Freddy Krueger, you know, their big horror icon, and that made a ton of money because of that. Why don't we get the rights for Friday the 13th, and then we'll do the same thing for Jason and possibly set the stage for a Jason versus Freddy movie. So they bought the rights to the Friday the 13th license, and they made Jason Goes to Hell the final Friday. And I remember reading the interviews with the director, Adam Marcus, and like Fangori and all that, and he was saying that we're doing things totally differently in this movie. It's not going to be a bloodbath. It's uh, we're trying to like actually tell a story kind of stuff. Turn up to all be bullshit because I used what Adam Marcus was saying in those interviews to talk a girl that I was interested in into going to see this movie with me at the theater opening night. And she did not like horror movies, especially slasher movies. And I was like, well, no, the, the according to the director in these interviews I've read, he's there. It's, it's not supposed to be a gore fest. It's not supposed to be about, you know, TNA. It's like it's telling a story just in a horror atmosphere, and according to him. And she's like, okay, that sounds kind of cool. Let's go. And we go to watch it, and sure enough, it is exactly what all these other movies have been. It's just about boobs and ass and gore. And then the different thing is that Jason is not even in this movie a whole lot. It, Jason is an entity that is hopping bodies, kind of like, uh, what was that movie, Fallen with Denzel Washington and The First Power with Lou Diamond Phillips? He's hopping bodies, and then it's basically just the actors who they're possessing going on killing sprees. And she, I remember she looked at me. She was like, you lied to me. I'm like, no, Adam Marcus lied to me. <laughs> and, like, there's that that murder where Jason, like, bangs. or he, There's a couple banging in a tent in the forest, and Jason grabs, like, a, a was it a street sign post? And, like, stabs the girl in the back while she's orgasming and leaning back on top of the guy while she's on him and sticks the signpost through her chest or through her belly and then move, like moves it up and like cuts her open like this and her body falls apart that was when the girl i was with was like what the fuck <laughs> and i was like i'm sorry i am so sorry i did not know it was going to be like this the director said all these things and apparently he was just trying to get people in the movie theater because they're banking on this being a big hit and it's terrible i think this is the absolute worst movie that they have ever made in the Friday the 13th series. I absolutely hate it. Even the unrated cut, I hate. Even though it's gory and all that, I don't give a shit. I don't give a... I hate it. I absolutely hate it. And yeah, it leads into a little gag at the end of the movie where all that's left of Jason is his mask in the sand, and you see Freddy's hand come up out of the sand and grab his mask and pull it down into hell or whatever you want to call it. Ugh. The only thing I like about the movie is... And it was funny because my brother, my little brother was there as well in the theater that night, but he was sitting on the other side of the theater, of the auditorium, and when they kill Jason at the beginning of the movie, they blow him up. And they're bringing, bringing his remains to this morgue. The screen has superimposed on it, like the name of the morgue that they take him to. And it's like, uh, was it uh, Youngstown, Ohio morgue? My family is all from Youngstown, Ohio. And when we saw the Youngstown, Ohio morgue across the, the screen, I leaned forward. And then all of a sudden I see on the other side of the auditorium, my brother leans forward and we both look at each other like, holy shit. <laughs> um, but yeah, this movie is freaking terrible. I hate it. But what, that came out in like 93, I want to say, because that came out the year I graduated high school. And then in like 2002 or whatever, we got an out of nowhere sequel, Jason 10 or Jason X. And this is, like I said, with Critters, this is where horror franchises go to die, outer space. So Jason is loose on a spaceship in the future, and he's using future tech to kill people. This one is cheesy as all hell, but I think this one is super fun. Uh, all the future tech stuff that's going on, like there's a holodeck, and there's that joke with Jason killing the, uh, the sorority girls in the uh, sleeping bags. And he's like, he's got them tied up in a sleeping bag, and he's whacking them up against the tree, but they just keep on giggling because they're holograms. And he's getting frustrated, and you, it's really funny. Um, <clears throat> the kills, like the frozen face kill, they're all really creative. I just wish it had a better musical score because it's got this super cheap Casio score that I hate. I needed like a rock score or a techno score or something like that to just keep the energy level up and the acting and it's really bad. But I think it's just really, really fun. It kind of came out of nowhere and I was like, yeah, that's actually entertaining. Uh, but yeah, that bombed horribly. But instead... They kept on going with it, and they eventually gave us Freddy vs. Jason in 2000 and 
2003, I think this was. Yeah, 2003. <clears throat> this is super fun. Uh, Don, what's his name? Ronnie Yu, who directed Bride of Chucky, did this. And, like, he was uh, did nothing but, like, weird Hong Kong horror action movies, like kung fu horror movies in Hong Kong. And it this movie just is constantly moving, constantly moving. It is super fun. They play with the lore of both characters a lot. I think it's really interesting, like, lore-wise. But, like, it's just, I absolutely love this one. It is so much fun to watch. And Robert Englund just hamming it up as Freddy, like, for the last time. Absolutely love it. I uh, saw this in the theater opening night, and that was such a cool crowd to see a movie like this with. People were screaming and laughing and clapping. It is so cool. The big fight between Jason and Freddy, even though it's a little weird to watch Freddy do kung fu, is just so ridiculous. It's really, really fun. All right, man, boy, Cave, have a good night. Yeah, hopefully I'll run into you this weekend, too. Keep an eye out. Uh, that one is super cool. And then we get the remake of Friday the 13th, which I hate. I hate. Uh, there was an actress that I was hanging out with for a little while in the early 20... No, the late, tw late 2000s. Uh, and we went and saw this together. She really enjoyed it, but I was like, that was bullshit. So what is the... Uh, the, the idea that they came up with to uh, justify making a remake of this movie? Well, Jason's not some undead killing machine. He's a mongoloid pop farmer. Yep. Jason intentionally grows fields of pot, of marijuana, in the fields by this old camp where all these like rich people have like like summer homes and shit. To draw teenagers to that land so he can stalk and kill them. Sucks. <laughs> and then we have a Friday the 13th collection bonus disc that has a lot of more. It has a lot of interviews with a lot of the actors and some uh, behind the scenes stuff, documentaries and all that. And then we also have a booklet. That has a lot of behind the scenes information as well. I have a bunch of documentation. I have like a big ass book, uh, the uh, Crystal Lake Chronicles or whatever it's called, and the like eight hour documentary about the Friday the Thirteenth movies, which is great. So this is kind of useless to me. And the thing about this box set was it came out like defective. So mm -hmm. since I pre ordered it, uh, I got one of the first batches, and it turns out three of the discs in this batch were were defective. So it was the 3D disc of part three. They There were reports that the 3D in the opening credit scene were, was not in 3D after all. I watched it. It looked 3D to me. So I don't know what they're complaining about. Um, there was a scene missing or a shot missing from Jason Goes to Hell. And it's during like the, the big diner scene. There's like a shot of somebody's arm being broken. That people who have probably watched that movie 500 times would notice that a shot was missing from the unrated cut of the movie. So that was screwed up. And then there was also uh, the scene with the sleeping bags from Jason 10 or Jason X had no sound. So there was all these errors in here. So if you could prove to Shout Factory that you purchased this firsthand and not like through some like you know used copy of it or whatever... Uh, they will send you replacement discs, and that's exactly what they did. They sent replacement discs. And then Jason from Corpse Flood Gaming, my buddy Jason, was like, just give me the ones that uh, were defective. I don't care if there's a shot missing or there's no sound in one shot of the movie or whatever. Just I'll take them. So I gave them to him, and he has them now. So, yeah, yeah. So that was a lot of talking about Friday the 13th. We're almost done. <laughs> so now we have the remake of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. With uh, Rooney Mara and Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig was the last person I ever expected to see in this. <laughs> James freaking Bond. But it is the same as the original Dragon Tattoo movie and also not. It's I think this one closely, more closely follows the book. I did read the first book. Uh, it more closely follows the book. I like the portrayal of... Um, Elizabeth Slander in this one a little bit more. Rudy Mara, I think, played her a little closer to the way she was in the book. But I like uh, Nomi Rapace's performance in the other movie more than Rudy Mara's. Uh, and it's just as hard to watch. 
in those scenes that you know what I'm talking about. But it's a, still a great movie. David Fincher did this, and he really tries to make all the scenes that take place in the snow out in the wilderness, you know, where the last chunk of the movie takes place, he really makes that look bleak as hell. So it's great. And that was a movie I went and saw in the theater with my dad on Christmas Day. I remember the trailers for the remake called it the feel bad movie of the year. And sure enough, like me and my dad go and see this movie that's all about like sexual atrocities and, and shit like that on Christmas Day. <laughs> and it was, I was just kind of like, yeah, that, that movie's still disturbing as all hell, but it's still rad as hell. And then I have these two double packs of Godzilla movies from Japan. We have Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack, and Godzilla against Mecha Godzilla. These were ones that came out in the 90s when they had a little bit more special effects to work with and a little bit more of a budget. And they're a little crazier too, but these are the ones that I think are like super, super fun. Like the fights between all the monsters in these movies are fantastic, so I had to have that. And then this one is to Godzilla Tokyo SOS and Godzilla Final Wars. Final Wars is fantastic. It's directed by, oh, God, what's that dude's name? Oh, shit, I can't read it. Ryuhei Kitamura. He did this movie called Versus from Japan that I really like. I'll talk about that when I get to the Blu-ray of it. He also did this movie called Izumi. <coughs> he directed a couple of American movies. He did this one called The Midnight Meat Train, based on a Clive Barker story. The guy is a crazy-ass visual stylist. And you apply that to a Godzilla movie, and holy freaking shit. It is amazing. There are some of the craziest fights in this one. And as well as having, like, like what was it, Power Ranger shit going on with the human characters, where they're, like, super soldiers that do, like, parkour shit. But, like, every monster from a Godzilla movie is in Final Wars. It was... Supposed to be the last Godzilla movie for like a while, and I don't think we got another one until in, from Japan until Shin Godzilla. Um, but the cool thing about this is there is a scene where the Japanese Godzilla fights the American Godzilla from the Roland Emmerich movie from '98, and he basically kills it in 30 seconds. He basically picks it up, throws it onto an arena, and then shoots his like his like laser breath thing at it and blows him up. And it's supposed to be really it is really funny when it happens. So really happy to have that one because Final Wars is great. And then we have another Fincher movie based on a book, and that is Gone Girl. So this is in this oversized, almost like a book-looking case. Uh, this one is fantastic. I did not see this one. I've seen, I try to see every Fincher movie in the theater, which is why I wanted to see Dra Girl with a Dragon Tattoo in the theater because it was a Fincher movie, even though the subject matter is not great. <laughs> Uh, but this is the only one that I never saw, and I was kind of pissed off at myself for never getting out to seeing it. Uh, but this one is fantastic. Ben Affleck finds out his wife is not who she says she is, and there's some really twisted shit going on in this movie, and it's fantastic. It took me for a real loop. And it also comes with the amazing Amy Tattletale book that has a big part to do with the main character in the movie. If you've seen the movie, you know if you know, you know. <coughs> that is super cool that it came with that. Yeah, this movie's absolutely fantastic, and it has a great ending. It's like, what are we going to do? I love that whole thing. Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Awesome. I absolutely love that one. Almost there, guys. Almost there. This is another one. This is probably going to be one of the longest streams I've done in a while, too. Then we've got the In the Line of Duty 1 through 4 box set. I picked this one up last year based on a recommendation from... What was it uh, Serial at Midnight, which is a physical media, a movie physical media YouTube channel. The guy talks about 4Ks, Blu-rays, and all the kind of stuff, like stuff that you don't know about, that you might not know about coming out from all these boutique labels. He makes an effort to point them out for everybody and uh, bring attention to them. So he was talking about this set, and he brought up the fact that Michelle Yeoh is in two of these, and I love Michelle Yeoh. Didn't start, I, ever since I saw her in uh, Super Cop back in the 90s, I was like, she's awesome. I will watch anything she is in. Uh, and then this also kind of came out to bank off the fact that she was nominated for an Oscar last year for Everything Everywhere All at Once. And uh, it turns out she's in the first two films in this series. These are like cop movies, like cop action movies, kind of like the female version of the police story movies. But the thing is, they came out they came out, out of order. And how so? So... From what I understand, the first two movies in the series, although they don't have in the line of duty as you know in the title at all, 
The first two movies are called Yes, Madam and Royal Warriors. So what I understand is Yes, Madam was originally made to be the first film in the series and Royal Warriors was filmed to be the second. Well, the thing was, I guess after these, the first movie was done, they watched the screen. Like they, I guess the people that made the movie screened it, and they were like, this isn't all that good. So the same thing that kind of happened with the uh, uh, Missing in Action movies with Chuck Norris, where they filmed the first two movies back-to-back, -back, watched them both, and were like, wow, the first movie, which was supposed to be the one of, uh, uh, what's it called? The first movie was supposed to be the movie that's about Chuck Norris in the concentration camp in or the uh, what do they call the POW camp in Vietnam and him escaping. And the second movie was going to be about him going back to Vietnam to rescue the remaining POWs. When they watched those two movies, they were like, "Well, the movie you filmed to be the first one, which was the movie that took place in Vietnam, was terrible. But the one you've made about him going back to Vietnam, which is the second movie, is actually really good. Why don't we release them back like reversed?" We'll release the one about him going back to Vietnam and then release the first movie as a prequel. Or the second, yeah, the first movie as a prequel, but bill it as a sequel. That's kind of what happened here. They saw Yes, Madam. They're like, it's not that good because, you know, what's supposed to be an action movie is actually more of an action comedy and more comedy than action, even though it's got Michelle Rothrock, or uh, sorry, Cynthia Rothrock in it in a major part. And it's supposed to be pretty bad. So I guess they were like, no, we'll make this the second movie. We'll hook them with Royal Warriors, which is the better movie of the two. And that's what happened. So technically, yes, Madam is part one. This is part two, but they released them the other way around. But the thing is, Michelle Yeoh, I guess, didn't like that and didn't come back for the other movies in the series. So when they started calling it in the line of duty, three and four, they cast a different actress as Michelle Yeoh's character. I still have yet to watch these, though. That's my bad. That's what happens when you have five million movies in your collection. But yeah, I haven't set, a, set aside the time to watch these yet. And it comes with a big-ass book. It's all about the making of the movies. and has, like, the old posters and all that. These even came with posters. So I've got the original. Or this is the new Royal Wars poster that was made for this box set. Here's the original Chinese Hong Kong Royal Warriors poster, which is kind of... Unimpressive, if you ask me. But from 1980-something, probably would have done okay. And then here is the poster for the entire box set. Out of the, all the movies in this box set, from what I understand, Royal Warriors is the one that's the most popular. Uh, so that's why it got its own poster. And then the box set poster that has all of the characters on it from all the movies. And then a poster for Just Yes Madam on the back. Because Michelle Yeoh. And she is freaking hot as hell. Still is. So there's that. I'll probably bring this with me this weekend as well. Maybe we'll watch this at uh, Rocket Sauce's place. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about tonight is this. The In Search of Darkness trilogy. These are documentaries about the, make, about the making of horror movies from the 80s. And from what I understand, they only intended to make one movie, but they ended up getting so much footage from interviews and stuff that they ended up, that kind of like overlapped other movies. Uh, so like they'd be talking to somebody from one movie and they'd be like, well, I was also in this other movie. You want to talk about that? And they're like, yeah, sure. And then now they have another movie's worth of stuff to talk about. Then they ended up just extending it into three movies. So the first one covers... Well, each one covers the entire decade. So it starts, it goes from 1980, excuse me, 1980 to 1989 and covers like the biggest horror movies from each year. And it has like, this has Nightmare on Elm Street in it. They talk about Friday the 13th, Reanimator, Halloween, like Halloween 2, I guess. I don't know, they don't really have the list of movies that they talk about on here, which is kind of shitty. And then each one of these does the exact same thing. It covers 1980 to 1989, just a different set of movies from each year. This one covers Return of the Living Dead, Dress to Kill, stuff like that. They don't like they don't have a list of movies that it covers on here, which is kind of stupid. But this one came with a slip cover because I ended up kickstarting this over Indiegogo. And uh, that was when the third one was coming out. And if I paid a certain amount, I would not only get 
the third movie in this like exclusive Indiegogo slipcover. Uh, I would get the second movie in this exclusive Indiegogo slipcover and the first movie with never got a slipcover apparently. And this like outer box, it's like really hard cardboard outer box to keep them all in as a set. Third movie, the one that I kickstarted is the most disappointing of the three because I guess they ran out of things to talk about because the first two movies covered like all the big ones that you would think about. This one decides to go the direct-to-video route. So it covers like direct-to-video movies from every year from 1980 to 1989. And some of them are like bottom-of-the-barrel kind of movies like The Brain and like really, really cheesy movies that you might not have heard of. So it's kind of like, eh. <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, I paid for this one, but I got these other two decent ones out of it. So, yeah, what can you do? That's why I don't really do Indiegogo Kickstarter stuff very often. You never know if even you're going to get the thing that you've paid for or if the thing you're paying for is even going to be worth it. I think I've made out okay with this, uh, especially like the first two doc, uh, documentaries. The second, the third one's not the greatest. Let's see. So does it make more sense to watch Missing in Action 2 before 1? No, actually, it when you watch them in order of that they've been released, it makes more sense because if you were to watch part two, and I think I've, I've watched, I have this, the trilogy, that's another box that I'll talk about next week. The, the one that was supposed to be the original, the one about him in Vietnam is boring. The one about him in the POW camp, it's boring and it's dumb and it's badly made. So like, I understand why they decided to make that the second one and just turn it into a prequel. The first one is the better movie. So definitely watch one, two, three, watch them the way they're, they were released. It's it, it's better that way. Okay, so that is it for tonight. That is a lot that I covered. I spent way much, way too much time talking about Friday the Thirteenth, <laughs> but I could talk about movies all day long if given the opportunity. Way more than I can talk about the video games. So I will be back next week, not on Thursday, because I am going to be working late on Thursday. I will be back on Wednesday. Uh, for t next week's stream. Next week, Wednesday, uh, 8.30 p.m. Central for the second part of the box set stream. If I continued going with all the rest of the box sets, we would have been here for another two hours. And I, no, I don't want to do that. I got, I got stuff to do. I got to go to a convention tomorrow. I got to start packing and shit. So I will talk to you all hopefully next week. And then don't forget, because the Midwest Gaming Classic is this weekend, I will be adding all of those pickups, and there will be many, to the pickup stream at the end of the month, at the end of April. So keep an eye out for that. So thank you, everybody, for coming to hang out with me tonight. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I'll run into some of you at the convention this weekend. Stay safe out there. I'll talk to you next week. Chris of Midlife Crisis Media out.